So today we're talking about communicating risk um, and we're really lucky to have Kakia who is an expert in this field. This is just one of our many webinars as part of the Bounce Back from COVID-19 series, helping you get ahead um, and back on track following the pandemic. About us. This um, webinar has been brought to you by the Business and Local Government Data Research Centre and we're proudly supporting organisations, both business, charities and public sector across the UK. We're funded by the Economic, Re uh, Economic and Social Research Council, who have been running for over 25 years now, providing groundbreaking research that really is shaping society. But there was always something missing, a missing piece in the puzzle, and that was data, data analytics. As a result, they funded us, and that's exactly what we provide. We bring uh, research and data analytics outside of the academic walls and into the real world to have real world impact on policy and practice. We have three main priority areas. They are methodologies and techniques in data science and artificial intelligence, local economic growth and supporting vulnerable people. Through these three priority areas, we work with the research community, public sector and charities, as well as businesses, helping them to use data more effectively. We have leading experts from across the world working with us and we provide a service for you. You can keep up to date on our work and our publications on blgdataresearch.org and you can also follow us on social media. One of the ways we can help you is through something called a data analytics innovation voucher. This is a way of accessing grant funded data analytics support and we're really pleased to announce a flush funding round is currently open. It closes on the 3rd of July and if you'd like to find out more, please contact me after this webinar and I can speak to you directly about any potential research projects you have in mind and where you require data analytics support. Since 2014, we've worked with a range of organisations, both small and large. They include Essex Police, Essex County Council, um, large and small organisations, Centrepoint, which is a homelessness charity, and many more. We can support you with training, grant funded data analytics uh, projects, webinars, workshops and a consultation service. This is your opportunity to enhance the power of data that you hold, because data really is changing the world around us. Today, specifically, we are providing you with some virtual training, uh, a virtual um, webinar. But please do follow us online to find out more about the upcoming webinars. You can find us on Twitter at BLG Data Research. You can also join in the debate online. We love it when people get in touch with us through social media to share ideas and comments and best practice. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it over now um, to Kakia. Um, her research focuses on a number of areas, including data science and natural language processing, but she pushes the boundaries of research. She has worked with a range of organisations across the UK and probably worldwide too. She leads training for policymakers on evaluation practices, text analytics and data sharing, and really does act as a catalyst for change at both a strategic and operational level. Um, so Kakia, uh, with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to you. Stop sharing my screen um, so that you can begin sharing your slides. Thanks, Laura, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just before I get started, um, I, I'm sure you've already uh, found that out the um, chat button. It's good to uh, hear uh, who we have um, with us today and please keep using it to um, chat with each other, uh, say things. But if there is a specific question you would like to ask, please, we would ask you to please record it in the Q&A um, section so that 
it helps us manage the questions uh, between us a little bit better. So if there is a question you'd like to ask us to be answered, um, I will stop throughout my uh, lecture today uh, to, for the opportunity to go back and have a look at questions, but also that we have left some time towards the end uh to uh sort of uh answer these questions fully and um i'm sure again you've discovered it already but there are uh, some meeting con meeting controls about your audio and um uh, towards the bottom of, of your screen and also uh there is an, a full screen button again that enables you to, to put this powerpoint presentation in full screen if need be so uh that's just a brief couple of brief things about webinar communication but before we go on to get to know each other a little bit better just to say a little bit more about me so uh, I am a senior research officer at the uh, ESRC business and local government data research center uh, my expertise as uh, Laura said is around um, communication risk communication data and emergency planning as well as um, um, from a public administration point, point of view, as well as using text analysis to do, um, 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 to look at unstructured data and study it further. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about a, an aspect of my work with uh, the COVID-19 press briefing corpus, but I'm not going to touch on the corpus per se, I'm just going to talk more generally about risk communication. Um, so, is it all right if we ask you a little bit just to understand a little bit who's in the audience? Because um, um, normally I would have asked uh, around in, in the room, but um, Zoom offers this as a tool for us. So, can we have uh, you should see very shortly a poll showing up asking you which sector you work for? Uh, could you please just briefly? Uh, type in which sector you come from so we know a little bit how to tailor our message today. Uh, everything we're, go we're going to talk about applies to uh, all different sectors, but it's just interesting for us to know as well uh, who we have in the audience more generally. So I'll just give you a couple more minutes, maybe one minute more, Laura, if that's okay, just for people to put in because I can still see people answering. Okay, so um, you can see that we have an fantastically equally uh, split today between charity and uh, public sector. We have a few colleagues from private sector and, and other um, uh, organizations as well. So uh, welcome everybody and it's, uh, it's fantastic to be um, uh, in a position to um, share some of the findings of my work with you and also get your insights as being people working on the ground around that. So um, so today I'll be going through some uh, fairly uh, straightforward but not simple. Uh, uh, so I'll, I will try to define what risk communication is in, in, in my context of work anyway. And I would, I'm looking forward to hearing more about whether your definition is slightly different. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I'm interested in it and why I, I bother studying it. And then um, hopefully through the series of, of um, um, examples I have prepared for you, I can show you that there are a few things we can learn from previous examples of um, disasters, emergencies, crisis, where we had to communicate risk and we had to communicate uncertainty and also how it has influenced behavior change uh, at the time. And um, I will also touch upon how we can use data uh, effectively, hopefully, to communicate risk, but also give you some examples where this has hindered effective risk communication. And I hope that what you can get out of this is some, some good practice, um, international good practice, uh, and some pointers to go and do some more re um, reading if you wanted to about how to improve the way you communicate risk during critical times and during non-critical times as well. But critical times is more important because um, there's an urgency, there's lack time and limitations and so on and so forth. Um, so before I move on, uh, can I get some, uh, Laura, would you mind just confirming that you can see everything okay and you can hear me okay? Is that all right? Yeah, everything's showing through perfectly. Fantastic. I'll move on, crack on with the rest of the presentation. So, uh, 
let me first talk a little bit about risk and communicating it. So um, hopefully that will show up. Um, now I will press play. Can you see the video? This is the Aedes aegypti mosquito. It's the so what I will do is I'll let you, I'll let, I'll let this play, it's a two minute video, it's not very long. This is an example of how uh, another risk, a couple of years back, uh, Zika vi virus was communicated at the time. This is a video that was published by, by Bloomberg. Uh, this is uh, an international uh, media press organization. So I'm just going to play that, leave that, and uh, please let me know in the chat or um, Laura if there are any problems with, uh, with uh, sort of, uh, uh, listening or viewing it. This is the Aedes aegypti mosquito. It's the main mosquito that carries Zika. Developing a Zika vaccine could take years. So right now, officials' only tool is to control mosquitoes. So here's the situation. The Zika virus was first identified in Uganda in 1947 and was thought to cause only relatively mild flu-like symptoms. In May 2015, Zika appeared in Brazil. By November, Brazil had seen a 20-fold increase in babies born with abnormally small heads, a birth defect called microcephaly. Months later, the Centers for Disease Control confirmed Zika was the cause. Some countries have even taken the unusual step of telling women to put off plans for pregnancy. The spread of Zika from Brazil to other countries and territories in the Americas has been rapid. In July, officials identified what are likely the first cases of local mosquito-borne Zika transmission in the continental U.S. So how does Zika spread? The AEDs transmit Zika by biting someone who has the virus and then biting another human. The virus then moves to new areas when mosquitoes hitch a ride on travelers or cargo, or more often, when patients infected in one place go to a new territory and are bitten by mosquitoes there. Scientists have also confirmed that it can be transmitted through sexual contact. Only about one in five people infected show symptoms. For those who do get sick, the illness isn't usually severe and lasts about a week. Some Zika-affected countries are also seeing rising cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome, a nerve disorder that can cause paralysis. Now here's the argument. Right now, the main way to stop Zika is by using traditional methods to control mosquitoes. Another strategy that's currently being tested is genetically modified bugs. The Brazilian government has expanded a pilot program that releases male mosquitoes that have been modified so that when they breed with wild females, the offspring die early. Studies have shown high success rates, but opponents fear unknown consequences. The technology is also in its infancy. As more people travel, there's a higher chance of mosquito-borne diseases like Zika spreading to new places. Ultimately, authorities will need better weapons against bugs. So this has given us um, just a kind of a, a teaser at how risk can be communicated. So in this case, we had very clear visuals, uh, very little text. Uh, we I also had uh, um, the pressing questions of the public answered, like what it is it? How does it get transmitted? How um, can I um, stop this from happening to me? So um, let's see a few more. And I think as we as we uh, develop our, uh, our talk today and um, a discussion, we will be able to um, uh, sort of get a uh, get this down to a pattern and then to some good best practice. So here is another example again from for Zika. Uh, so Zika virus, World Health Organization posters. What do you need to know about Zika? So this is specifically targeted targeting a pregnant women and what they should be careful about because at the time uh, it was uh, they were one of the vulnerable uh, groups that uh, were more likely to get it. So here's another example. This is now a nuclear disaster. Fukushima in Japan 2012. This is the nuclear um, meltdown after the tsunami. And here you see an example of um, representing the risk of radiation between Japan on the left and all the way to, uh, to the US. And the estimates, you can see how they are represented in terms of when the radiation will reach and which areas. So again, you see very much um, based on um, putting things on a map and trying to visualize things. Um, there are things that we will see could be improved, but um, um, 
it is an example of how risk gets communicated in this example. Here's another, the one, the picture on the left is um, um, on, on site, a sign telling that this is not, entry is no longer allowed and uh, due to the, um, um, to the accident. And then you have the, uh, a, map, a map on the, on the right-hand side telling you a little bit more about um, um, the different, uh, the spread within, within the Japan mainland and the radiation levels that they were expecting then. And more recently, <coughs> you can see an example of a, a similar um, a virus again, uh, like we have these days with coronavirus. We have Ebola and we have uh, examples of where borders have closed. This is uh, an attempt to also use uh, some, some numbers and statistics there representing deaths and cases and where it has spread. So that comes from, a, um, from the World Health Organization, but it's a graphic that was published in a newspaper or a blog, to be honest with you. Uh, and then we see on the right hand side some signs uh, t trying to explain to the public uh, how the Ebola gets transmitted and how you can get that and how you can prevent um, what it gets transmitted through and what it doesn't. So you can see that it doesn't get it transmitted through air, water and food but um, you can get it through uh, various um, uh, body fluids, contaminated objects and infected animals. And again, here's some guidance by UNICEF. Uh, so this is a visual that was uh, targeted to um, 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 young adults, so teenagers. Uh, you can see again, you have quite a lot of uh, visual imagery and uh, te text that is not uh, so dense and um, getting us to today, really, some examples, I mean, uh, of COVID-19, communicating the risk of COVID-19. On the very left-hand side, this is a um, leaflet or um, poster by the Republic uh, of Ireland. And you have um, HM government, NHS, wash your hands more often for 20 seconds. You see some site safety signs. Uh, and then some some information about how to protect and uh, keeping distances and washing hands. And then more and more of these again um, from the public health agency on the left uh, across, around the world as well. So not just uh, from in, in the UK. So, uh, so on the uh, right hand side, we have the COVID-19 um, infographic from ECDC. So this is the European Centre for Disaster Control. Um, some, uh, another example here on the left, we have uh, one uh, addressed to kids and a site sign, uh, attention to visitors, please make sure that you check your temperature and you make sure you don't enter this site unless you, um, it's more of a self-screening uh, sign. So asking, asking uh, visitors to self-screen uh, before going in the building. So, before we try and say more, um, I, I would like to ask you a little bit and understand what your understanding is of risk communication and communicating risk to users and clients and other stakeholders. So you should very shortly uh, see uh, a poll showing up asking you that question. Um, and we will leave that as well now. It should be up on your screens. Um, we should leave you maybe a minute to get the opportunity to uh, answer that. Uh, you can, you should be able to select more than one choices if you wanted to, that's fine. It's just trying to understand again what your motivation is for um, and what you think your understanding is around risk communication. We are going to leave it for a couple more seconds so that everybody has the opportunity to vote on this.
So you should now be able to see the poll results. So an overwhelming majority has uh, answered that they would like to know more about the factors to consider when communicating risks. Hopefully you should get, at the end of this uh, webinar, you should be uh, getting a lot of resources around that to uh, get you started with that at least. Uh, we have got some information about latest research findings and where to find best practice in communicating risk. Um, so thank you very much for res responding to that. So hopefully when we ask you the same question towards the end uh, at our survey, you should be able to get, indicate that you've, you know, um, you've, you've reached some sort of familiarity with these uh, elements. So, um, so why is information important during an emergency? So during an emergency, you have the crisis of the circumstances. You have very heightened public emotions. Uh, everybody, uh, there's um, loads of um, concern and worry about life and about our um, loved ones. There's also limited access to funds and also, um, so funds by that we mean resources as well. So you remember what happened with toilet paper and flour, still flour, the situation with flour is still the same. Um, and also there is huge uncertainty. So there's rumor, there are gossips, there's speculation, there's assumptions, there's things we infer from things that are being said that are not clear. Overall, we have a very unstable information environment. So information is very important. Accurate information and timely information is very important during an emergency because uh, there is a need for rapid and effective assistance for those affected. Uh, you need that information to be correct so that you make uh, accurate uh, decision making and appropriate decision making, but also you coordinate properly. And uh, it is essential for uh, with whatever organization needs to communicate risk for building credibility, reading visibility and building trust, which is essential for bouncing back, recovering from any crisis. Um, emergency risk information uh, and the characteristics of it, uh, especially around the crisis, is that there is high demand of it. There's an urgent time frame. So uh, people would like to know things really quickly and things evolve and change a lot. Uh, it requires rapid and effective dissemination. Uh, we need to use the preferred channels of the key audiences and this is to make sure that you minimize time and you reach out to them as quickly as you can. Uh, you need to know what the existing sharing networks are to be able to use them effectively and uh, circulate the uh, existing information through them. You need to balance traditional versus non-traditional media. Again, your uh, primary um, kind of the goal, your rule of thumb is who is it that my my audience the people I'm trying to reach will, is more likely to get their information from and you need to know that hopefully before the crisis strikes there's also misinformation rumors so these will hinder the work of of you as an organization trying to communicate accurate and effective information and it needs to be managed um, um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good way so that you um, trust carries on throughout the crisis and helps you and the your customers and your in the individuals involved in the crisis to uh, bounce back so risk communication is uh, something that has been defined in various ways but in my work I take it to be the two-way real-time exchange of information advice and opinions between interested parties. And the reason why I say there's many definitions, there are people in the literature, scholars who have said, this is not really a two way exchange of information. This is a, 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 an exchange of information between the organization and the, and, the, and the public. So the public only listens. I don't think from my work, I, I found out that this is not really what, um, um, will ensure your success because you might say something but it's not guaranteed that the public will listen so for me it's a two-way communication so the public the interesting parties not just the public all interested parties need to be informed about what the risks are and they need to be in a position to get the correct information at the right time to make decisions about how to best manage them and that involves both the public decision makers 
anybody who might be involved in the crisis situation and affected by it. Risk communication includes multiple messages about the nature of the risk. Um, any concerns the stakeholders, the people involved might have, opinions, reactions to risk messages, as well as legal and in institutional arrangements for the management of risk. And all of them play a very important role. They sort of interact with each other and help each other, but also can hinder one another if um, they're not uh, in place. So um, you both need scientists who know the details of how, for example, uh, the um, crisis can be managed and can offer advice, as well as the policymakers, as well as all stakeholders to sort of contribute in that interaction. The purpose is to enable everybody at risk to take informed decisions to mitigate the effects of the threat or the hazard uh, or the crisis and to make sure that protective and preventative action is taken um, either before for future uh, uh, crisis or if possible and you were looking at this before the crisis has happened in, in a protective way in a preventative way so that risks from the threat are minimized next time it, it occurs and lessons learned are very very important and I'm, I'm giving you a reference there you can go in and read a full toolkit that uh, uh, World Health Organization in this assistance has about risk communication it's and as you can see it's fairly old 2009 so this is not news the building blocks of risk communication includes both technical information, values, values of the public, expression of care, both from the organization that expresses their risk and the uncertainty, building of credibility through accountability and through um, regular communication and, and trust. And trust with the, we in literature says and we scholars think is very, very important when it comes to uh, getting out and bouncing back and from, from a crisis and making sure things get communicated properly. So people have the right to be informed about risks and how to protect themselves. Communication helps influence their behavior change. Misinformation and rumors must be identified early and addressed. And I will, I can't stress enough upon this, frequent and frank communication honest communication will build support for the emergency response and will build and maintain the trust. Uh, this is essential for people to follow your advice and support the response when the time comes. So uh, we would like now to ask you a little bit about the, asp the aspects of risk communication that we have just discussed, as well as others that you think might be relevant, which of them are more relevant to your and your organization. Uh, so asking you your opinion about this and you should get a poll showing up very shortly. So we will, we're going to leave this for again a couple of minutes to see. So how familiar would you be around communicating risks to uh, users and clients and other stakeholders at this point in time before we tell you the best practice? Give, give it a couple more seconds for everybody to vote. So we uh, we are speaking to uh, I think the, those that uh, so most of you seem more to, to think that they are moderative mo moderately familiar with with the issues. We look forward to your comments and uh, and thoughts, but hopefully we'll take you to um, um, one step, your, your knowledge one step up with this. So before uh, we give you, we, we, we give you some best practice that we have come across through, um, through research, um, we would like to um, uh, touch upon some of the national and international risk communication frameworks. So as I said, Risks, crisis, and communicating risk is not something new. It's something that um, organizations and international organizations have had to deal with in a uh, crisis worldwide. So again, we're going to give you some pointers about some of the frameworks that have been used in the past that you could also take some um, um, ideas from. 
So uh, the first one I'd like to uh, look uh, uh, briefly is the international health regula regulations um, um, kind of toolkit uh, by or framework by the World Health Organization. For them, uh, risk communication is a core capacity for mitigating the effects and outcomes of health events and emergencies. And I've offered you a link there. Uh, you can, um, we will share the slides at the end so you can go and, and have a look at the actual link. No need to make details notes about the link right now. But in sum, what this framework uh, is sort of uh, requiring or uh, is, is suggesting this to happen is that all these elements, legislation and policy, coordination, surveillance by in the nicest way, not in the kind of monitoring, I think is a better word, but they, they've used surveillance as their word, uh, response, preparedness, risk communication, human resources and laboratory. By that, they mean the science, the, the work that needs to happen in the lab to identify uh, the risk. They're all essential elements. So risk communication is one of the pillars for, for handling, dealing with, with, with an emergency. And they see all these elements uh, uh, sort of interacting both at a national and an international as well as a, at a subnational and local level. So for them, it's very important, depending on what the crisis is, for good coordination to happen across the different levels of government, as well as among different teams and among different elements. So um, risk communication, uh, so the, the way they model emergency risk communication is by saying that initially, uh, we need to have some systems in place. So the risk communication systems that you see on your, uh, on your screen right now. And by that, they mean elements such as strategies, plans, structures, resources, simulation exercises to test systems, uh, stress, uh, stress tests, all these elements need to be in place before the emergency happens. There also need to be, and I'm moving on to the next kind of uh, slice in the pie, um, internal and partner communication and coordination. So there needs to be mechanisms at all different levels, national, local, um, subnational, international levels with different stakeholders that talk to each other. Healthcare workers, NGOs, volunteers, civil society, citizen groups. Um, and for that, these two elements to work together, there needs to be communication with the public. So there needs to be an understanding of how these work and how the public and how the different stakeholders get their information through media, social media, web, social mobilization. So how can I, for example, push out loads of emergency information very quickly to all these uh, groups of people that I need to, I need to, when I need to. Um, communication and engagement with affected communities is essential. Uh, ideally it needs to have started before the crisis, but uh, during crisis as well, it's important to um, be able to communicate and engage with them directly or through different influences. For example, uh, awareness campaigns can be run, uh, community radio, um, um, like spots or uh, sort of um, uh, podcasts can be, can be broadcasted through interpersonal communication, using existing community engagement mechanisms, so a kind of more like asset-based approach to, uh, to uh, community engagement and manners, understanding what's out there and how it can be used and how it links with each other to be able to uh, get you the maximum uh, spread of information. Um, but also uh, it needs to be, that's why I sort of said it's a two-way process. It doesn't need to be one way towards the community it needs to be listening to the community as well so dynamic listening and rumor management is essential according to that framework because uh, you need to be able to uh, uh, observe monitor media and social media for rumors and and sort of fake news um, look at what partners stakeholders and communities say uh, offer feedback um, uh, be able to dispel some myths if necessary, be able to communicate accurate information. Um, and our framework is again, the World Health Organization Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework. Um, again, I'm giving you the link. Uh, this is from 2011, and, but it has been uh, updated since then, but that's the original publication date. 
Um, and in the UK, we have the Orange Book. Uh, this is um, the um, kind of civil service manual in the UK, uh, where uh, management of risk principles and concepts is sort of outlined. Uh, in there, it establishes the concept of risk management and provides a basic introduction to its concept, development, implementation of different risk management processes in government organization generally. And again, I've given you the link, feel free to explore. I'm just uh, going to quote some sections that I thought were interesting for us just to have a look at before we move on to the next framework. So according to um, the Orange Book, communication should be continual and iterative, supporting dialogue, providing and sharing information, promoting awareness and understanding of the risks. So this is the guidance to, uh, to any kind of um, governmental or civil service organization that needs to communicate risk and manage risk. Um, and um, then the, uh, the, uh, the next section, C5, talks about communication and consultation and co-production of information as being the core of um, that relationship. So understanding the risk faced, bringing together professional expertise, and those that uh, know about public management and public administration and members of the public as well. <clears throat> and um, I think the very last bullet point is, is, is sort of up in, in, at the heart of what needs to happen during a, a crisis, build a sense of inclusiveness and ownership amongst those affected by risk so that people feel enabled to support people, feel enabled to help and contribute in resolving the crisis and getting out of the crisis as well. Um, some additional ones I'm not going to go through in detail. Um, so the humanitarian action framework is another uh, framework that talks about risk, how to communicate risk uh, throughout the life cycle before, during and after a crisis. Uh, and I mean the WHO uh, World Health Organization constitution itself talks about uh, how health is a human right and social justice and how um, informed opinion and active cooperation of the public are very important in improving public health. So even in a preventative way and, and for issues that are not crisis related, good information, um, good flow of, of risk information and in, in, informed, in, being informed helps generally. So they say, uh, WHO says in their, in their risk communication framework, there are six things you need to do during a crisis. First of all, whatever you do, do no harm. Then second, build trust. Third, announce early. Four, be transparent. Five, reset, sorry, respect public concerns and then plan in advance. So this could be a blueprint for you if that suits your purposes to build your, your risk communication strategy on. All the other ones also, but they express it in very simple ways and you know there are six things you need to do and here they are and we'll see examples where that has failed um in the next section of the talk so um to communicate risk properly uh, you need to identify uh, the hazard assess the risk develop the policy implement the policy and evaluate the policy but um, in addition to this, as we said before, there, there are certain things you can do, and these are our guiding principles for you to take home and think about um, and, and, and sort of um, consider how they might work within your organization. So create and maintain trust is more important. It's very important. Acknowledge and communicate even in uncertainty. So tell people what you know and tell people what you don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know. I will need to find that out or we don't know yet because we don't have the information or the data. Coordinate properly, be transparent and fast with all communications, be proactive in public communication, uh, involve and engage those affected and use integrated approaches, building national capacity and supporting national ownership. And I've skimmed through now very quickly all, all of eight of them, but I'm going to go through each one of them at a time. Uh, before I do that, do we have a question? Yes, we do have a question. Uh, Laura, would you prefer if I take that now or should I wait for the end? 
Um, I think uh, because of the timing, if we wait for the end and do questions and then we'll see how much we can get through, would that be okay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, just because I saw that popping up. So I just wanted to make sure. So I've stressed uh, creating and maintaining trust a lot. I'm not going to go through it again, but uh, the thing to leave you with is that you are more likely to get your advice and your word out there if you've already built trust and you've maintained transparency and provided timely information. Make sure your information is easy to understand as well. Use loads of visuals. Use as little jargon as you can. Um, communicating in uncertainty is really difficult. Uh, risk communication occurs in a complex shifting environment and information is usually incomplete. So you need to recognize that information and advice will be shifting as the emergency evolves and you need to monitor rumors and misinformation accordingly. Listen to, the, to your stakeholders' concerns, show empathy and acknowledge that. And as I said, acknowledge what you don't know. It's okay. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength, actually. Um, coordinating before, during and after an emergency is, uh, oh. Um, Laura, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. That's okay. Uh, one of the delegates said that the volume has gone, but hopefully I just wanted to double check that uh, you, you're all still with me. So coordination, as I said, before, during and after emergency uh, is very important. Um, proactive and in internal communication as well as coordination with external partners is essential. Um, and trustworthiness and accountability again is, is very important. Make sure you address uh, information and um, that comes to you and also any public concerns as you communicate your risk message to your stakeholders. Um, let me click on the next. So be as transparent, regular and fast as you can. Uh, I've stressed that before in my talk, but in an emergency communication should be fast, frequent, sustainable. It should be a point of reference for everybody like they do for the daily, daily briefings, for example, around the world with with um, the, the pandemic right now. First announcement will frame risk and address concerns. Consecutive announcements and interactions should build rapport and trust and include what is known and what is not yet known. And because it will be frequent communication and frequent contact, you uh, can um, build on um, the information that you're sharing and share more and in an accurate way. So people will know that they will be, um, there will be a point in time in the future that they will be able to speak to you or hear from you again. Be proactive. I can't stress enough the importance of setting the discourse as an organization and reaching out to all stakeholders, <clears throat> building trust and report and preventing rumors and misinformation. Be as sincere as you can. And if you don't know it, just say so. Engage with communities before and during and after an emergency. The communities will be the heart of your emergency response. They are the key to you creating trust and rapport and it will help you um, make sure that the whole, um, all the elements work as a system and will help you build resilience. Co-production of emergency plans, either prevention recovery or a uh, mitigation stage will be really, really important. And people will feel, as I said in the beginning, they feel their own part of the process. So, so they, they were very likely to engage with you. Let community know that they are part of the solution. That way there will be, there will be this uh, kind of collaboration to try and get out of the uh, emergency together rather than um, um, the community expecting somebody else to do it for them. For them. It's all about context and the culture and the work you've done in creating that circle of trust with the communities and communicating your values will be something, will be what could be, a, some, could save somebody's life down the, down the line in terms of crisis. Uh, make sure you integrate different approaches to fit your circumstances. So that's why we're offering you different frameworks 
uh, in your current crisis situation in your in your organization or, or domain some might work better than others uh, use different channels and adapt your approach as the crisis evolves finally uh, one of the uh, um, um, kind of uh, elements that have been studied around the world, especially when it comes to crisis situations, is that there are uh, silos within um, uh, either a domain or within a country um, when it comes to national capacity on an issue. So try and build with your stakeholders and other kind of uh, organizations that share the same values as you or might be, you might interact in a future crisis. Try and build uh, some capacity <clears throat> and support some national ownership, strengthen the policy, be able to lobby if you think something needs to change in the policy, review these plans, uh, know what your plan is first, but review these plans, <clears throat> train your personnel so that they are comfortable to uh, follow the, uh, the protocol and the, and the plan uh, when the crisis comes, it will be like second nature to them. Cre create and review these processes and tools regularly through evaluation or monitoring and um, co-production uh, is something that uh, um, is very helpful it's a bit more difficult than creating it on your own because you have to ask other people what their opinion is and they have to input and you need to allow time for this however um, the output that you get at the end of this is something as I said that will be um, have raised awareness about the situation and about the, the, um, the, the potential crisis that you're planning for, but will also make people feel that they own part of the process. And this is really important. So I'd like to spend the, uh, maybe a couple of more minutes showing you um, some slides, some examples of how complex scientific and technical information um, has or has not been communicated properly. <clears throat> And just give you leave that as the last thing for you to think about to allow a few minutes for uh, uh for questions as well so the example i'm going to take is from recent work i've been doing on the covid 19 press briefings around the world so i'm going to show you some examples of how the new cases have been communicated over time in in the official press briefings in the uk uh, what, what I will be stressing, what I will be showing you is how, what is included in each of the pillars, in each of the elements, I'm going to show you what the pillars are, changes over time, <clears throat> how cases are initially aggregated, then broken down, then aggregated again, and how communication changes over time. And uh, if you're in it, if you don't take the elements and, and, and uh, study them, you don't really notice, but once you see it, as I'm going to show you now through the different slides, you're going to see what the difference is. So this is the slide for the new UK cases from the COVID press briefing slides on the 30th of May. We can see that uh, there are some numbers, there are the number of cases. This is, this is just a number of cases is what the purple stands for. We have some notes about uh, some of the assumptions or some of the uh, kind of limitations of the data. Uh, for example, these were after a few days after initial testing, and there were many more cases than currently recorded here. Um, and uh, maybe 10 days after that, the 10th of April, this changes slightly. So the reporting now includes two different pillars. Pillar one, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, is uh, the numbers of new cases tested by NHS swab testing. Uh, that relates to somebody with a medical need and the most critical key workers. Pillar two, which is the orange element in your uh, graph, is the number of commercial swab testings, or at least the number of new cases uh, identified by commercial swab testing, uh, where key workers in the NHS, social care and other sectors were tested. Now, a couple of days, maybe eight days after that, the definition of the pillar one changes slightly. So it's no longer the NHS, it's PH, Public Health England Labs and NHS. We include their families as well as their case workers. And for pillar two, we include the key, works, key workers and their households. All that without changing anything in the graph. Uh, on the 25th of April, the numbers are suddenly gone. 
So we no longer see reporting of exact numbers. We see um, the graph and we sort of can approximately calculate the number, but we don't get to see that. I must add that the actual data behind this graph are always available. So anybody who wants to go and look into it can get the actual data. However, what I'm really sort of saying here is communicating risk in, in, in a situation where you just communicate, you know, you just look at what you, you, you get, you, you're trying to formulate an opinion about risk, but just looking at this visual, nothing else. And uh, a couple of days after, again, the pillar one has been slightly redefined with a where possible. Uh, so there have been some changes in the data. Uh, we are also including symptomatic household members. Uh, and uh, now the swab tests uh, in uh, Pillar 2 are delivered by partnerships of universities, research institutes and companies. So we have further specification about who is doing these, these swabs. Um, again, Pillar 2 is slightly redefined here, but overall the picture remains the same. Uh, the 6th of May, we now uh, get a listing of how new cases were recording on the day of the report. Uh, and we get some information about the fact that the day tests were reported as of the 24 hours before the 9 a.m. that day. So we get some information about when the data was last updated. Again, we're getting some redefinition of the pillar two and the pillar one. But the major change happens between uh, b before and, and after the 12th of May. So, uh, so you see how, how different the, the, the visual is and how much more informative in some respect this is. So you get uh, a sense of the, of the kind of the line, uh, you get a sense of the change over time, you get fairly clear visuals about uh, how many cases were confirmed a day, how many we have in total, how many of these were tested, and you get an annex with statistical notes where, again, as, one, as I'm going to show, these things get redefined again. However, the visual remains the same, and it's, it's well, I think it's clearer, but uh, has got some issues as well. But uh, you get all the redefinitions and the details and the statistical notes. So just to give you a quick view of the reported cases, <clears throat> and how, again, they get redefined. So after 12th of, between the 12th of May and the 28th of May, we have one more pillar added, but again, not shown on the graph because we, we go, we look at the aggregate statistics. And then we have redefinition of that again after the 23rd of May to include the third pillar, pillar because they did more different tests and they wanted to break that down. So when communicating scientific information, um, Scientists, we need to, uh, as scientists, we need to be careful to communicate more effectively by focusing not necessarily at the uh, background and all the supporting details, but look at the bottom line and what the public cares about. So it's sort of reversing the, the pyramid in, in that respect. Um, the information should be relevant, easily understood, and expressed through well targeted messages. You should, you should use clear non-technical language and discuss risks, nature, form, severity, and magnitude. And I'm, I'm giving you with some, some sort of, um, I'm leaving you with some advice on how to, to communicate that and what to do and what to do, not to do. So using consistent names and other terms throughout it are very important. So it would have been great if all these redefinitions in the examples I've just shown you were upfront from the very beginning and we could compare how the change, the crisis and the risks evolved. Now, every time we, we look at the different graph, it means something different. So I need to rely on the interpretation of the speaker to be able to understand if this risk gets bigger or smaller over time. So it's really difficult to tell just from the graph. Um, don't switch between different units. Don't change different units of measurement. So, um, don't, for example, first report on UK and then look at subnational level or national level or county level. Um, use clear, consistent terminology, providing definitions in advance. 
and making sure all the information is explained fully and use visuals to clarify and support key communication points. Um, use analogies if you can and make the information relevant, not just numbers. Uh, the key question that the, the public mostly wants to know is, will this hurt me? So I'm trying to assess the risk as to my personal, my family's life. And in, if you're uncertain, as I said, indicate what level of uncertainty that is, especially when it comes to statistics. So um, I'm sort of running out of time, but uh, leaving you with a few um, like uh, last thoughts. Um, remember to communicate early and frequently. Uh, make sure that uh, informed decisions can be made through the information you communicate, and this can help mitigate health risks. So the do no harm initial is really important. Communication is key. And hopefully I've, I've sort of shown you it's a two-way process. Effective and timely information will always help build and maintain, maintain trust. And coordination will need to be at different levels, both local, subnational, national and international. So I've sort of run out of time with apologies to Laura and everybody else, but um, maybe we can um, uh, move on to the Q&A session and answer some questions. Thank you, Kokia. That was fascinating. I'm sure everyone will agree that that was really useful to share some really cutting edge data um, and some research that I hope will inform your work moving forward. Um, I can see we've got a number of questions in the Q&A box. Um, so please feel free to add some more questions in there um, if you have any more. Um, Kokia, would you like me to read these out to you for, for answering? It would be helpful. Yes, thank you very much. I can see where they are, but I think it will be easier if you do. If you do, that's thank absolutely you. fine. So the first question is is a great question. It's the um, it comments uh, that the power of dynamics and issues related to the governance do influence the risk communication. What are some of the best strategies to address this to make risk communication more effective? Oh, this is a fantastic question. Thank you, Namneet. Um, E, this, uh, this is a whole talk on its own. Uh, very, very briefly, yes, definitely. Uh, I, I would agree power dynamics and it depends, <clears throat> depends on what, so, what sort of power dynamics are, um, are involved and which way it goes as well are very important. So just to give you uh, an example, um, uh, so, um, you could have, for example, uh, a situation where you need to communicate risk to, you are a, a government, you need to communicate risk to the public and because of various circumstances, um, your relationships, uh, your relationship with the public is not good. So um, you will need to, uh, the strategy to go about that is to first of all, understand what the power dynamics are I'm assuming that you are asking as a professional who is trying to help <clears throat> either the government or generally an organization to communicate risk effectively. Uh, you will need to understand what the power dynamics are and what the issues are. But um, uh, I think you would need to start by building um, the, the pillars that I mentioned before around trust, around communicating things promptly and quickly and effectively. So hopefully um, that sort of has given you a first kind of um, um, direction, but happy to uh, elaborate on that offline as well, if that's uh, something that you're interested to know more about. Um, the next question is, is there a tension between iterative development of communication and clear, consistent messages that are easily understood? Another great question. Thank you. Another great question. Absolutely. Um, so um, there could be tension between uh, overload of information, of course. Uh, but uh, what the literature has shown is that uh, if you are communicating frequently and the message does not change, uh, you know from the very beginning what your core message is and that doesn't change in a major way. Uh, then uh, really the tensions are, are, uh, are minimal. The tension will arise uh, if your 
communication is frequent, but your messages are not consistent and your messages are not clear. Uh, and uh, that's where uh, confusion and frustration happens. And that, this is when listening stops as well. So uh, you're more likely uh, to get that tension happening when people get fed up with listening to different things at different times. People will not uh, take you seriously. Whereas if it's the same message communicated frequently every day, but it's the same message, you probably get fed up, but in a different way. But it's a great question. Thank you very much for that. Another really good question is just coming. Um, it is, are you a fan of three word slogans such as stay at home? Um, I don't mind them. Uh, for me, uh, it's a personal preference and it depends on what the person that thought of the slogan uh, uh, thought about. Uh, stay at home is a very clear message. It means stay at home. So from that point of view, and in the context of coronavirus, I think it, it makes sense. Um, I don't have a particular preference or otherwise, so long as the message is clear. So um, one way that scholars do that is by um, testing different uh, slogans and seeing which one works better in terms of behavior. Uh, but I understand that in, the, in, a, in a crisis like what we did, we, you wouldn't have the, the, the kind of um, luxury to go and ask people, what do you think is this a good message? So um, it needs to, uh, it, will, it, will, it will be these campaigns will, will run and it, they will be out there. But also, uh, um, as with everything that has to do with crisis communication, uh, because everything evolves so quickly, we need to monitor and review and evaluate and change accordingly. So if we see as communication professionals that our message doesn't get across and doesn't change behavior, then we need to change the way we articulate the message. I think, would you agree, Kakia, that research for communications in general, rather than just communications and risk, does favor uh, slogans and the three words, three to five words, tends to be something that is more memorable that people seem to respond to more so. And we can see that across the private sector as well as public sector with catchy slogans that perhaps you even remember um, as an audience um, that just stay in your mind. Um, so the research is there more widely. It's just about how that translates into risk communication for slogans too. Absolutely. This is not just about risk communication. This is about communication in general and a uh, very valid point, Laura, all, all you said. So generally uh, we have uh, people, not myself, but people, a psychologist who study um, um, memory and who study how we perceive things and how we, we remember things. Uh, have said, you know, it, it's, it's common knowledge that um, you would remember less words is better and, you know, acronyms or uh, uh, like um, um, slogans that make up another word, um, like WHO, for example, World Health Organization, are easier to remember than, uh, but it's general about communicating and, and marketing and, and rather than risk communication. It's just that for, for risk communication, we also use elements from that uh, science, from the, uh, how we communicate ideas and marketing, essentially, to be able, because what we're trying is to market, in some respects, um, a message. So we need that message to go across. So we will use anything that we have at our disposal to do that. Thank you, Kakia. Uh, we've got another great question. Um, any suggestions for navigating where the data leads you to conclusions that are at odds with political goals of the overseeing organisation? For example, data held by local government contradicts the national government. Another... Uh, oh, this is a great question. It depends on who you are and what you want to do. So... Um, where the data leads you to conclusions that, uh, so data uh, will lead you to some conclusions that will not be, uh, you know, you, you have tools and methodologies to validate them. Uh, political agendas are not so easy to statistically validate, let's put it that way. So it's down to who you are and what you want to do. Uh, 
my taking, because I'm not somebody with an agenda, political agenda, I am a researcher at the university, so I tend to be kind of independent from that struggle and not have to face that, thankfully, in my work. I, um, I take the, the view of uh, following the data. So um, if the data is telling you something and you've checked your data and your data tells you that this, this is it, then maybe there's something to be said about it uh, that maybe if it contradicts the political agenda, it will have to contradict the polit political agenda. It depends on what's more important for the person who's, who's studying this. I uh, hopefully I've, al I've alluded to an answer there, but if you want to follow up, please uh, write more comments there and I'll, I can say more. I also think that's a great uh, segue into our next webinar, which is about how data has shaped the world's approach to COVID-19. And that's going to be a panel debate where we talk about the successes, the challenges and exactly how data has been brought to life um, during the pandemic, um, looking at all different aspects. So for those of you interested in um, the political to's and fro's and how data really has been used, please do join us for that next webinar, which is coming up in a few weeks time. So moving swiftly on to our next question, uh, another great one from one of our attendees today, which is what risks do you think charities need to be aware of and communicate most of all? Um, depends on what charity you are, uh, what sector, charity sector you're working for. Um, um, maybe if we think about the recent pandemic, uh, I think uh, all uh, organizations now need to know how to communicate. If you plan on opening um, in the next coming weeks, you need to be in a position to communicate risk around the pandemic in an effective way. And there are tools um, um, to do so. Um, um, uh, you, all you need to do is look, look up some resources that are available on the Ministry of Health. Uh, and also uh, Public Health England as well. So Public Health England, actually, their material is, is really, really, um, is really good. Now, um, other risks you might have or you might need to communicate as a charity is, for example, if you are a charity that works with vulnerable individuals. So again, um, there might be risks involved in interacting with them that are not necessarily a crisis, but it's, it's still an uncertainty and risk that you need to communicate. I would say just follow the rules of thumb and then see how they apply to you. Um, if there is a specific group of individuals you identified, target them first. Make sure that you build report and trust. Make sure you are transparent. Uh, make sure you um, say things uh, as um, uh, like accurately and transparently as possible. Uh, of course, there will be times, especially when you need to communicate risk about a specific individual to that individual that you need to factor in other things. Uh, so this is not just a blank risk communication. This is uh, more like um, talking to somebody about the, their, their, their issues that we're getting to a completely different area there. But hopefully that has sort of answered your question but let me know if uh, if you have a specific like question about a specific domain and how risk can get communicated there i would also add as well that when uh, charities are working with vulnerable people there may be some communication that's coming out nationally or internationally that you need to tailor um, the communication and how you're articulating that to them so that they follow the national guidance um, I would also say that another risk, particularly for charities that they want to be aware of as a priority during this time, is changes to services. So many of you are digitalizing the services that you are delivering. And during this transitional period of changing from face-to-face -face services to digital, it's important that you communicate this to your stakeholders so that they are aware how to access your services when they need it most. Good advice. And generally, looking at... Uh, what other people have done, lessons learned by other organizations similar to you or different to you is always, always helpful. Uh, provide. Yep. Can we have a question that you can answer very quickly, Laura. <clears throat> yes. Um, you, uh, I've got a question here that's uh, asking about how they can apply for uh, the grant funded data analytics support we provide. Um, you can email me directly at laura.brooks 
at essex.ac.uk. Um, as we come onto the final slides, we'll also have our generic contact details on there and I'll be picking up on your emails as well. Um, so, Kekia, would you like to move on to the final slides? Yep. And we so, sorry, these are just uh, some links helpful. So this is what you wanted or the next one? Um, yes, so this is great. Um, so we've got more fantastic webinars coming up. Uh, we have a whole series to help you bounce back from COVID-19, um, starting with this one. Um, and then obviously we've got the next one on the 15th of July about how data has shaped the world's approach to COVID-19. Then we're back on the 29th and the 30th of July for another virtual masterclass this time on GDPR. Um, and then in August, we are looking at how to help you create your data strategy, uh, a short workshop helping you uh, create that strategy that you need in order to optimize the information that you are collecting. And then back at the end of August, we are helping you with conducting a data audit, identifying those gaps and what you need to do for next steps. You can register for all of these on our website, which you can see now in the bottom right hand corner. Kakia, would you mind moving on to the next slide? Sure. Thank you very much. In October, we are helping you understand the value of accessing open data, how it can help you baseline needs and understand much more about the sector you're working in. We'll be talking you through how and why open data is useful for your organization. Then in November, we're looking at the visualization of data. Data is not just numbers and it's not just words. It can mean a lot more. And this is about how visualization of data really is key. In January, 2021, we're looking at social return on investment. Let us help you prove your worth. And we've got much more as well coming up um, throughout the year. We just haven't confirmed the dates yet. So please make sure you visit our website, blgdataresearch.org and follow us on social media so that you can be the first to know when these go live. Finally, thank you ever so much for everyone for joining us. You can see our social media channels here on the page now. We have a YouTube channel uh, where you can catch up on past webinars or some of the past webinars and our email address is on there too. And finally, thank you ever so much Kakia for sharing some fascinating research on how we can all communicate risk more effectively and why it's so important at this time and moving forward too. And thank you all for joining us and for those fantastic questions. Thank you all for tuning in. I'm sorry it overrun slightly, but thanks for sticking with us. And um, we look forward to your comments and engagement via Twitter. So if there are any more questions, I'd love to pick them up by Twitter or by email. Uh, so uh, be, please be in touch. Thanks, everyone. Take care and look after your health and your happiness. Bye.